Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. We live in a world of tragedy. We live in a world of nothing but heartache and problems. But we have a God that is our mighty fortress. And he has a perfect plan for our lives that even though we may not understand, we will someday. And um, what he desires is that we trust him and that we let him be in control. And that is what I desire for my life every single day. And as Christians, we don't have hope only. We have hope, but we have more than that. We have assurance because Jesus has died for us. And we can say as this song, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Sing with me. submission all is at rest was looking at my records and um, saw that the last time I was in this church was almost four and a half years ago. Um, and it is really wonderful to be back. And I want to share with you something exciting, you know, recent, and personal uh, that has happened uh, since the last time I was here. But first, I want to say that in 1997, I got married. And uh, of course, that's not news because it's been a long time. Um, and I am certain that when people get married, 
the last thing they think about is something is going to go wrong, right? Because weddings are such happy and joyous occasions. But something did go wrong. And seven years later, we got divorced. And I went through the most painful and difficult years of my life. In fact, it seemed like it was never going to end. There were days when I couldn't get out of bed. Weeks when I didn't eat and I didn't notice and it didn't matter. The phone would ring and I was afraid to answer it because I know it was people calling to find out what was going on. Some with good intentions and others not so good intentions. And then I would stand up to do a concert or a worship service or a presentation. And it was as if somebody was standing behind me whispering in my ear, what are you doing here? How can you talk to people about Jesus when your life is a mess and you're a bad example? And I got to the point where I was afraid of standing up to play and to speak. And I thought, maybe I should get a real job. Maybe I should do something low-key. And it almost happened. I almost gave it all up. I was in a church in Oregon, as a matter of fact, on a morning presenting a worship service, except that this was a mega church. You've seen them on television, right? The ones with flashing lights and smoke machines and big stages. And there was a big stage and there was a huge praise team. The, the people was, they, they were up on their feet singing. The pastors were seated at the platform. And they were waiting for me. I was supposed to be up on the stage because it was my turn to go up. But as I, I, I was in the bathroom, crying. I was so afraid. I thought, I can't. I can't go up there. I'm going to fall apart. I'm just going to find my violin case, put the violin away, run out of this place, and never, ever play again. And it was at that moment that I heard a voice that said, go out there and talk to them about me because it's not about you. And as time went by, the Lord healed my heart. It seemed like it took forever, but he did. And three years ago, I was in Charlotte, North Carolina on the weekend of Mother's Day. That's where my mother lives. And so I scheduled my concerts in that area so that I could be with her. And my last presentation ended at noon on Sunday. So the rest of the day, I was able to spend with her, and I took her out to dinner. And we had a long and wonderful time and conversation that late afternoon, early evening. And one of the things I remember saying to her was, Mom, I've decided that I'm never going to get married again. It was too difficult and painful. I said, you know... I'm just going to marry my violin. She has nice curves. <laughs> and she only talks back when I tell her to. At a concert recently, a, a married man said amen after that statement. <laughs> And I heard later that the ride home was life-changing for him. <laughs> well, I finished talking, and when I finished, my mother said, Son, it's okay if you feel this way, but don't limit God if he wants to do something else in your life. And I thought, that is so like my mother. I dismissed the statement. But apparently, God did want to do something else in my life. You see, in... July of 2010, I had gone to Washington, D.C. for a weekend of concerts. And at the end of the first concert, as I greeted people in the back, a young lady with a beautiful smile came to say hello. And she took a CD, and we exchanged just a few words. And then she walked away a few feet to a circle of her friends. And they began talking. People came to the table, and they continued talking, and I overheard what they were saying. And so when things kind of quieted down here, I went over to that circle, and I 
joined the conversation briefly and interjected something, and then I came back to the table, and that was it. Well, four months later, I got a friend request from Rochelle on Facebook. Have you heard of Facebook? Just checking. And I remembered her. She had a beautiful smile and a very peculiar and distinct last name. And so I said, Rochelle, how are you? How are things going? What are you up to? And so she kind of filled me in a little bit briefly. And one of the things she said was, I have a sister that lives in Atlanta. And she has two small boys. And I'm going to go visit them soon. And I said, really? Well, I live in Chattanooga. And Chattanooga is not too far from Atlanta. When you're going to go, let me know, because if I'm around, I would love to see you. Maybe we can get together. And she said, that sounds great. So she gave me the date, and it happened that I was going to be home. So at that point, I went to her Facebook page, because I wanted to learn about her. I wanted to see what kinds of things she liked so that I may suggest a restaurant or an activity that she would like. And I looked at her photo albums. And I saw that she loves sports. There were pictures of her playing volleyball, pictures of her running races. In fact, she'd run a marathon not long before. But it wasn't just that. She had been into sports seriously. At one point, she had been a professional women's football player. Now, I must admit, I didn't even know that the sport existed and so I was intrigued. I went to see more information about her career. She had been a running back. She played for 11 years. Rushed for 14,000 yards. She was a Super Bowl MVP and champion. I saw pictures of her in action. And when I saw this picture, I was disturbed. Because I thought, is that what's going to happen to me if I do something she doesn't like? Is she going to run me over? And so very cautiously, I thought to myself, well, she likes sports, so let's do some sports. And so I said to her, when we get together, do you want to go jogging? And she said, yes. And can I invite you to go to a hot yoga class after our jog? Now, before anybody here gets worried and calls the conference office to tell them that Brother Jamie George is talking about yoga from the pulpit, I want you to give me the benefit of the doubt because I had never heard of hot yoga. I had never been to any kind of yoga because I had heard of negative things associated with yoga, as I'm sure you have. However, this kind of thing is very different. There's no time to meditate because it's too hot. And I will explain it to you in a minute. And so I happened to be home all week. I got home Sunday night. We weren't going to get together till Friday morning. And so I started training. All week I jogged up and down my neighborhood to get in shape. <laughs> well, I knew she was going to beat me, but I didn't want to, her to embarrass me. And so... I trained faithfully by Thursday night. I was confident. I was excited. I was jogging five miles in one hour. That is a 12-minute mile. Recently, a gentleman came up to me after a concert and said, Dude, I fast walk a 12-minute mile. <laughs> but I thought I was doing well. So Friday morning, I go pick her up, and we go to the park. And within a few seconds of our jog, I realized that Rochelle's pace is about 40% faster than mine. She's going at about eight and a half minute mile. You do the math. And so now I had to reconfigure my entire jogging plan because I had to count for sucking enough oxygen to survive this jog. <laughs> the only problem in my plan... But through a monkey wrench in this, she wanted to talk while we jogged. <laughs> and so she would rattle off a string of sentences like she was walking in the park. And then she would ask me a question. And so I tried to restrict my answers. Usually they went something like this. 
Yes. <laughs> As we get to the end of the third mile, she turns and she says, I feel good. Do you want to run a fourth mile? And I looked at her and I said, yes. <laughs> but we're going to miss a hot yoga class. <laughs> And she said, you're right. And I thought, thank you, Lord. <laughs> and so we stopped and went over to the studio. I walked inside the studio. It was 110 degrees with 70% humidity. And we spent 90 minutes inside that oven doing nonstop heart-pumping exercises. I was covered in sweat from head to toe. I lost 1,200 calories. <laughs> By the end of the 30th minute, I couldn't understand what the instructor was saying. My mind was starting to run and run in circles. By the 60th minute, I looked up, and I thought I saw the heavens opening and Jesus was coming back. <laughs> By the 90th minute when I laid on that mat, the whole room spun. I was traumatized. In fact, when I left that place that afternoon, I said to myself, I can't handle this chick. <laughs> and so I didn't speak to Rochelle again for 18 months. And then a year and a half later, one afternoon, I went to Facebook and on the news feed popped up a picture of Rochelle. She was on vacation. And she had taken a photograph doing one of the same postures that had nearly killed me a year and a half before. And I had such a visceral reaction to that photograph that I got on my mobile phone and I sent her a text message immediately. And the text message said, I hope you're having a good time. <laughs> but you can't read tone in text. And she thought I was saying, I hope you're having a good time. And so she texts back, I am. I hope you are too. <laughs> and then I thought, wait a minute. I'm going back to D.C. in two months. So I said, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be in your area. I have several concerts. I'd love to invite you to one of them. If you have time, would you consider going jogging and then go to a hot yoga class? <laughs> and then I thought, why am I saying this? Well, I went, all these things worked out and happened. And when the weekend was over, I went home and I called her and I said, Rochelle, I don't know what you think of me or if you think anything, but I'm going to pursue you until you tell me to go away. And so every day for about five or ten minutes, we text. Two weeks later, she was going back to Atlanta to see her sister for Thanksgiving, and I had a concert at home, so I invited her to the concert, and she brought a part of her family with her. And the morning after the concert, we sat down to talk, and I said, listen, I have been a failure at all my relationships in the past. And I don't want to keep making the same mistakes I've made before. Instead of jumping into a relationship and then finding out things aren't working, I want to find out first if things are going to work or not. So I have a list of questions for you. If you answer them correctly, we can keep talking. She wasn't upset. She pulled out a notebook from her purse and said, I brought a list of questions for you too. <laughs> so one asked and the other one answered. And when we finished, it was what the other person was looking for on paper. And so we knelt down and we prayed. And I said, Lord, if this is your will, please open the doors. And if not, shut them now. Well, the next month we began dating Two months after that, I asked her to marry me. And five months after that, we got married. And I can tell you, I had given up on the thought that I would ever experience this kind of love, peace, and joy again. But we serve a God that doesn't know the meaning of the word impossible. And it doesn't matter what's happened in our lives. It doesn't matter what we've gone through, what we've experienced, what we've suffered. God is able to take those bad experiences and turn them into something positive for his honor and glory. 
He's in the business of renewing, changing, and transforming hearts and lives. And if you have a problem today, I invite you to turn that problem over to the Lord. I can't promise you that he's going to make that problem disappear or take it away a little or at all. But what I can guarantee is that not only will he walk with you, he will carry you every step of the way until the very end. Because that's how much God loves us. I want to sh share with you a song that talks about this wonderful Savior that we have. Have you heard of the singer-songwriter Michael Card? He wrote a song called El Shaddai, and we would like to share that song as a duet for you now. Hope you enjoy it. Oh, I want to tell you that despite all of these wonderful things that happen, I was still afraid to marry a professional football player. So before we got married, I promised myself that I would always do everything she says. And as a result, we have a wonderful and happy marriage. <laughs> when she said to me, honey, can we get married at the beach? I said, of course, sweetheart. And anything she asks or tells me to do, I do because happy wife, happy life. <laughs> Okay, if you clapped, you have to sing. El Shaddai, El Shaddai, El Elyona Adonai. Age to age, you're still the same. By the power of the name, El Shaddai, El Shaddai, Erekum Kana Adonai. Abraham, and by the power of your hand, turn the sea into dry land, and to the outcast on her knees, you were the God who really sees, and by your might, you set your children.
As we get ready to wrap up our service uh, today, I want to thank this church for the opportunity to be here once again. I want to thank the pastor, the staff, um, everyone that's been involved. Uh, I want to thank the AV team for doing a fantastic job. Uh, it's wonderful to be back here um, and see some uh, old friends like Jeff and Melinda. Um, and it's Great to see some new folks as well. And I pray that the Lord will continue to bless each and every one of you uh, and this church so that it can continue and you can continue to be a beacon of light in this community. Uh, and I want to know, do we have anybody here that is visiting this church for the very first time today? Would you raise your hand? Fantastic. Welcome. Anybody else that's visiting? You've been here before? Praise the Lord. God bless you. Um, I hope you've enjoyed um, this service, which to me is a little bit of what heaven is going to be like. Because you know something? In heaven, there won't be any sermons. That's why preachers are so long-winded. Because they're out of a job when they get to heaven. When we get to heaven, we're going to be praising God and singing and playing. That's why it was so wonderful to see folks singing up here this morning, whistling, playing the violin, the trumpet, the guitar. That is exactly what we're going to be doing when we get to heaven by the grace of God. And um, just a brief little announcement. Um, at the end of the service, as you leave in the lobby, uh, we are going to have a table set up. And if you want to take any of our recordings, CDs, and DVDs with you today and enjoy this music that praises God and soothes the soul, um, we will have those resources at the table, and you can take them home with you on the honor system. Now, if there's somebody here visiting a Seventh-day Adventist church, let me explain to you why we're doing the honor system. And what it is, Seventh-day Adventists keep the biblical Sabbath from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. And these hours are set apart to spend in communion with God and in fellowship with one another. So when you go to the table, there isn't any exchanging of money or talking about money. There's a little form that you fill out, and the form has two parts. The left side of the form, you fill out and leave with us because that has your information on it. The right side of the form, you tear off and take with you because that has our information on it. And you take that along with your CDs and DVDs. And then when the Sabbath ends, you take care of it. It's called the honor system because it's between you and the Lord whether you follow through or not. Now, I understand the sun sets at 7.52, so my suggestion is that at 7.53, you follow through. <laughs> Amen? Amen. I don't need to say anything else, right? I will be there uh, to share with you and to talk um, and so forth. Now, before I play this last song, which is a song that we did to close out a concert uh, celebrating 25 years of music ministry, I mean, you will see a number of guests that came to participate. You already saw and heard Michael Card. You will see and hear him again. Have you heard of Larnell Harris? He is a gospel legend. You will see and hear him as well. Um, and we have uh, Jennifer LaMountain uh, that you will uh, also hear. Uh, and there's another gentleman who you may not have heard of before. His name is Kirk Whalem. But if you don't know his name, you will know this next name, Whitney Houston. Well, Kirk Whalem was Whitney Houston's saxophone player in her band. And I share this with you not because he played in her band or because he's won a Grammy or because he's the best gospel saxophone player in the world. No, it's because he's a Christian and he's an ordained minister. And he shared with me during this weekend that when they were on the road doing some of those huge concerts around the world, that sometimes she would come and knock at the door of his hotel room and say, Kirk, would you pray and study the Bible with me tonight? I need Jesus. And it made me think about the fact that as he witnessed to and ministered to her, 
we also have the same opportunity to share the love of Jesus with other people in our community, in our neighborhood, at our work. So my desire is that we would leave this place excited to do exactly just that. And speaking of sharing hope and salvation. Last year, I got a call from a friend of mine. His name is Pastor Sean Boonstra. You may have heard of him before. And he said, I want to share something with you. And when, when Pastor Sean speaks, you listen. And so he said, I am an ambassador for an organization that is changing the lives of thousands of boys and girls in India, Myanmar, and Bangladesh. What they're doing is they are sending them to Christian schools and giving them an opportunity to have a future, to learn about Jesus and give them edu an education so that they can share with the world. And I said, I'm very interested. And so in August of last year, just a few months ago, I went to India and I was there for a week learning about the work that Asian Aid is doing. And I want to share with you this short video about this visit and experience. I've been in India for just over 24 hours, and I have seen reports on television, I have seen magazine articles, but nothing could really prepare me for visiting a slum right here, right now. Um, it is an amazing experience, uh, and just as we were coming in, I met a young lady that almost seemed to be out of place. Uh, we greeted her, uh, she smiled, and then we began to talk. As it turns out, right here in this slum, she attended this school. She was able to break free of the path that most people have, which is a path to nowhere. Her life has been turned around. Her life has been totally different than what she might be if she didn't have the hope of attending this school right here in this slum. The story of this young lady is exactly why I'm here and why we're here. Her story is the story of hope. Her story is the story of opportunity, which is what this school does for the children and the young people that live in this slum. I am in the town of Viginagram, which is about an hour's drive from the city of Vizac, and I'm standing on what is part of the new girls' dormitory. It is really a beautiful facility, as you can see. Over here, you can see the structure that is going to be the new boys' dorm. They've actually been sitting, sleeping, learning, and eating in the church. But provision is being made by the grace of God through the donors that support the work that Asian Aid is doing so that this building, which will house 50 boys, will be erected here soon. As you see, it's on the way. But we have to think about the future. There is so much need. I am sitting in a classroom where more than 20 young students are able to learn. By their standards, this place is quite a luxury because their backgrounds are very disadvantaged. But the reality is, we need a new place. You saw the roof, it has a hole in it. Monsoon season is coming and it rains, and it rains a lot. And they have to leave this building to go to a very crowded place where they all sit together and then try to learn. It's also pretty warm in here. I've been here for just a couple of minutes and I have to wipe my face, my forehead, and my arms because it's so hot. I wanna see this change and I'm thankful that Asian Aid is here to be able to do something about it.
I've been here at the blind school for just a few hours, but in hearing them sing, I have been moved to tears. And it made me think about how music brings us together. And you know, the music and the songs that praise Jesus are the first exposure that many of these young people have had to Jesus Christ. They have amazing faith. It's easy for me to see that. And it is wonderful to be in a place where they are learning to develop and dedicate their talents and lives to use for God's honor and glory. I am here overlooking the beautiful campus of Sunrise Home, a place in the middle of nowhere in Carada Village. You know, when I was growing up, I had a wonderful family. I had parents that taught me to love and serve Jesus, but there was something that I didn't have, the opportunity to go to a Christian school. The orphans that are here don't have a lot of things, but they do have the opportunity and the privilege to learn about Jesus Christ from the moment that they arrive. Sunrise Home is a place that gives young people the opportunity to have hope and light from the moment that they walk in through the front gate. I have visited more than 50 countries around the world and I know what poverty is but I had never seen in my life what I saw when I got to India and it broke my heart and it made me realize just how blessed and fortunate I am and we are. When I walked through that corridor in that slum and I met that beautiful young lady at the beginning I started talking to her and I could see that this girl has a passion for Jesus Christ. Both of her parents have AIDS. And so her future looked pretty bleak. But Asian Aid was able to sponsor this girl to attend that school right there in the slum. She graduated after eight years. She went to another high school that Asian Aid supports. And now she's in college studying to be a nurse. And I said, what are you going to do when she finished? She said, I'm going to come back here and be able to care for my parents and help the people of this slum that need medical attention. When we went to the school with the holes in the roof, I don't know if you noticed, those sheets of roofing are asbestos. And we are in the process of trying to change that out so that they can have a clean environment to learn. The holes make it impossible during monsoon season for them to be in those classrooms anyway, and they're extremely hot. But those kids are so grateful because they are being sponsored. Their food is taken care of, their clothing, their medical care, their education. And then when we went to the blind school, I found out that those kids that are there are thrown out of their villages and their towns and discarded because of their imperfections and their handicaps, and they are left to die. But they are brought to this blind school where they're taught, they're given an education, they develop their talents, they play instruments, they sing, and then they have a vocation, and they go and they leave, and they can actually do something with their lives as well as share Jesus with others. And then the orphanage. The orphanage sits in an area that is infested with poisonous snakes. And people die all around all the time from these snake bites. But the director of the orphanage told me that there has never been one snake found inside the grounds of the orphanage. And I couldn't help but wonder if maybe there were guardian angels standing around that property guarding that location so that nobody would be bitten by those snakes. And every week, police bring children who have been abandoned and left to die to the orphanage in hopes that the orphanage will take those children. When I came back from that trip, 
I really felt that the Lord was calling me to do something to help Asian Aid spread the word that they are making a difference in the lives of thousands of children currently being sponsored all over India, Myanmar, and Bangladesh. And my desire was that I felt that one week in a month I should dedicate in my concerts to let people know about Asian Aid so that they could pray for Asian Aid and they could pray for these children and maybe get involved in sponsoring them. And I have the personal goal of having 400 children sponsored this year. My wife and I have sponsored 11 of them. And once a month as we go to the different churches, we invite people to perhaps give hope and, and life to these children that would otherwise probably die soon. For $38 a month, you can provide an education, medical care, food, and clothing for these children in the slum schools, in the high schools, in the orphanage, in the blind school. And I wonder today if there may be 13 people here willing to sponsor a child for a year. As I start to play this last song, deacons are going to come forward and share with you a little envelope that says Asian Aid. And I wonder if you would pray. You can go to the back of the table next to mine. You're going to see Sana and Steve, two of the most passionate ambassadors because they have been to India and they are sponsoring children themselves. You can actually pick up and choose the child that you want to sponsor today. And during the course of this year, you will get correspondence from that child letting you know how they're doing and how you're making a difference in their lives. I wonder if you would consider that today as I play this song. May we be reminded of the fact that we have a lot to be thankful for and that the resources and the blessings that God gives us are not so that we can just sit idly and enjoy them necessarily, but put them to use in His work to make a difference in other people's lives. I look forward to that day when there will be no more hunger. There will be no more pain, sorrow, sickness, persecution, suffering. Until that day, may we be faithful to the Lord in sharing his gospel around the world. Thank you for being here today, and may God bless you.
Well, that was not Amazing Grace, obviously. I lined up the wrong song in the order, so I apologize for that. But I think the Holy City is okay. Amen? All right, let us stand for the benediction. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this day. The rain came and then the sun shone. We're so thankful to live in a country where we still enjoy freedom. And we can come to a beautiful place to worship you. Lord, I ask that you would put on our hearts a desire and a passion and even a burden to share with others the good news that Jesus loves them and that he is coming soon. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity that we have to support your work. And I pray that we would be stirred today to serve you. And I pray that we would, we would desire to change the lives of these little children who don't have any hope. Thank you for the ministry of Asian Aid. And thank you for what we can all do for your honor and glory. Lord, may we leave this place with joy, with gratitude, and with a desire to be examples and living witnesses for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.